All right, so we're gonna get into uh, what I my take on this uh, on this lesson, on the discipleship course. Of course, um, we're in we're still in lesson seven, which is all about the story of Moshe. You know, and I entitled these chapters um, twenty two through twenty four. I'm not gonna believe this, but <laughs> covenant, <laughs> covenant, the Torah of Yahuwah is his covenant uh, with his people. They guard his word. You know, yeah. So I too entitled this message covenant. You know, and the characters. was Yahuwah, hallelujah. He was front and center, was he not? Um, but we also had uh, Moshe and Aaron. They were, they were um, characters uh, within, within these passages. And then we had Nadab and Abihu. And we also had the elders of Israel who, who were re also referred to as the nobles of Israel in this passage. And then, of course, we had the people. And just because scripture makes a distinction, I like to make a distinction, you know, um, so from the people and what scripture calls the children. Israel, you know, and so I like to make that distinction. And then scripture also pointed out another character, you know, and so I want to point him out too, and that was Joshua or Yahushua, um, our Messiah's namesake. Amen. Now, of these characters, of course, there were some main characters. And who I saw as the main characters of the passage of old. Uh, yeah, who I saw as the main characters. Uh, I might just draw some on my illustration. Uh, was Yahuwah. Of course, and then there was Mose, of course, you know, and essentially those are the two main characters. You know, you had the people and the children of Elohim, but most of it was an exchange between Yah and his servant Moshe. You know, and then of course we had a saying. And the setting is really, you know, is is, is really cool. Um, the setting is, is of course, is, is Sinai, as well as Mount Sinai. You know, and the fear of Elohim is still a part of the setting because you know, as um, they were still in fear of him because you know the mountain quaked and. You know, and he appeared as a consuming fire on top of the mountain and, you know, all this good stuff. And so, you know, they were filled with fear. You know, now the thing that I want to point out, though, is that, you know, even as this has a corporate interpretation, it also have an individualistic interpretation. You know, for at the end of the day, Israel is Yah's firstborn. Not firstborns, plural, but firstborn. Amen. And you can look at this in that respect. And in looking at it in that respect, you know, Mount Sinai and Sinai becomes hugely important, you know, as a setting 
because it means thorny or clay, clay, thorny or clay, you know, and, and the thorns, it was as uh, Yeshua, um, Henry pointed out in one of the, in the interpretation of one of his um, parables, you know, speak to the cares of this world, and the clay speaks to the flesh, you know, so you can see Israel or the son of Elohim in the flesh. Say a lot. Just figured out, point that out. You know. And let's not forget, while they're there, then they have the fear of Elohim, right? All right, so there's a plot. You know, and the plot is pretty simple because the plot of the chapters 22 through 24 are basically centered around Yah's Torah. You know, that's it, pretty much. Period. You know, and the plot is to bring, you know, bring forth that Torah to his people. You know, to Israel. You know, but I have some points of interest. You know, and one of the points of interest is why restore five oxen for an oxen, but only four sheep for a sheep? Hmm. Another point of interest is, why don't you find a thief breaking in? Um, it's okay to kill him at night, but not during the day. Another point of interest. Who are the gods referenced in Exodus 22? 28. Another point of interest. Why are the names of other gods not to even be found in one's mouth? Is there any harm to that? You know, just speaking their name. Another point of interest. Who's the angel spoken of in chapter 23? You want to find that interesting? Yep. Another point of interest. Why isn't the recipe for good health um, that's found in Exodus 23, 24 through 25 not taught, cooked, and served to Yah's people today? Another point of interest. Why does Yah send hornets to go before Israel to drive out their enemies? Why hornets? Why not the bulls of Bashan? Or elephants? Or lions? You know, why hornets? Another point of interest. According to Exodus 23 32, we're not even to covenant with the enemy. In their gods. Even during captivity, Yah's faithful served him. Say a lot. And we see in captivity, we see those such as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We see those such as uh, Daniel. You know, we see uh, Nehemiah. We see Ezra. We see, you know, these. These, these folks, even in captivity, they still serve Yah. Wow. And Yah used them mightily. Amen? Mm -hmm. Another point of interest. In Exodus 24-7, Exodus 24-7 teaches us what a covenant of Elohim truly is. How has this definition changed today? You know, in Exodus 23, 32, it says, you should make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. And in Exodus 24, 7, it says, and he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that Yahuwah has said, we will do. You know, now within this, you can see the very essence 
if you would, of a covenant. And you see that there is a very, very strong connection with the covenant and with doing. Amen? Does this not make it evidently clear that a covenant has to do with doing? Seeing that they said all that Yahuwah has said we will do. So this teaches us what a true covenant of Elohim is. It's a, um, this covenant says what he will do and what he says we should do. And we have a right to, to uh, enter in to that covenant or not. And we see here the people, you know, uh, unanimous, unanimously, you know, said all that Yahuwah has said we will do. You know, so a covenant has to do with doing. And, you know, and so I wanted to point that out because it, the, the definition of a covenant has pretty much changed over the course of time. Today, when people think of entering into covenant with Elohim, they don't think of doing anything except for saying, yes, yes, I, you know, yeah, I accept, you know, but then that's where the yes ends, you know, but we see here an ongoing yes is implied. Uh, a yes that I will do your will, a yes that I will keep your commandments, you know, your judgments, your statutes. We see an ongoing yes, you know, very strongly implied here. And, you know, and what is the yes to? The yes is to all that Yahuwah says. Amen? You know, and so when you enter into covenant with Elohim, you're entering, um, you're, you're entering into covenant with hopes of receiving his blessings in exchange you are agreeing to do all that he says but this is not communicated today when people speak of Yah's covenant especially the new covenant you know, people pretty much can gather the old covenant was centered around Torah. But when they speak about the break out of shower, the new covenant, no one equates to anything to, to, to doing. You know, so I think it's really important that, you know, that I highlighted that, you know, so that at least everyone here will know that when you enter into covenant with Elohim, it is centered about doing what Yah has said that we should do. You know, and, and if only each one um, teach one. And then and if, if only each one reach one and each one teach one, you know, we can we can get this out there, you know, and people know what it means to truly be in covenant with Elohim, that is, it involves in doing. It's not just, you know, something you believe in your heart, you know, and that's what it's, what it's been reduced to now today. It's just something you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You know, and they say, okay, well, that's it, presto, change them, I'm good. No, that is the start. That gets you through the door. That's where the journey begins. It's nowhere near the end. And so I just want to stress that point. You know, um, you know, now we have some conflicts and conflicts resolutions. And just for the record, I too did not find any conflicts. <laughs> you know. You can't be in <laughs> conflict when Yah is in your midst. When Yah is in the midst of you and he's speaking, you can't be in conflict. Everything's all good. Amen. Amen. You know, 
I wouldn't say that's an absolute, but <laughs> <laughs> in this case, you know, um, there was no conflict. You know, now, as Exodus 23, 32 said, you should make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. You know, um, I meant to put uh, the, the other passage in here. Um, uh, what what is it? Um, is it twenty verse eight? Uh, where about saying the names? Well, no, it speaks of um, uh, adhering to to the gods. I, um, I, I referenced it actually um, in my plot. Um, in my points of reference. Let's see. Uh, 2228. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, who has the mic? Uh, I get you to read uh, Exodus 2228. Thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people. Yes. You know, um, and like the point of interest that I spoke of, well, who are those guys that it's referring to? You know, and it pretty much answers the question. The rulers of the people. The rulers of what people? The rulers of Israel. Amen? You know, so, with that in mind, When he, when, when he says, you shall make no covenant with them, speaking of the enemy, nor with their gods, what gods are they talking about? Could it not be the rulers of the, of the not the rulers of Israel, the rulers of the enemies? And 20 verse 28 is talking about Israel. Here in Exodus 23, 32, it's talking about the peoples of the land, the enemies, the ites, you know, and he's, he said you should make no covenant with them, you know, nor with their gods. You know, and a lot of people read this and they think about, you know, Baal and, and Ishtar. And even though that 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 may um, also apply, you know, but in the same context is, is uh, in chapter 20, is this presented? You know, and it speaks to their rulers, which is what a guy is, strong judge of ruler. You know, and I think that's an important point to pull out. And so I'm pulling that out. You know, also let us consider Exodus 24.4. You know, since there was no conflict, I had to find a way to stretch this a little bit, you know, in case you're wondering, you know. <laughs> You know, but it was, these are some great points of interest, you know. Um, it's, it says in Exodus 24, 4, and Moshe wrote all the words of Yahuwah and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars. Well, I have an extra credit question. Anybody ready to get some extra credit? Some kudos? What type of altar did they Build under the hill, and and um and how do you know? Well, that just speaks to an altar. I'm asking what type of altar. He says stone. Oh, he says stone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have one for stone. We have anyone else? We have one for earth. Okay. Un, 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 uh, natural stone, not, not cut stone, right? Okay, natural stone, not un, uh, unhewn stone, yeah. that is, not, not hewn stone. Huh? Right, not cut by man's hand. Or, you know, anyone else? We have some more types of altars. Okay, how about some um, some reasons why, you know, why you, why you choose stone, why you choose earth? Because it's 
Because the commandments was in stone. That don't have nothing to do with us. Yeah. Uh, you said stone. So why'd you say stone? You said what? It was a guess. It comes later. Oh, what comes later? Yeah, of course. Didn't it already come up? Stone because I know that they had to make the altar and then they crossed Jordan, right? Yeah, but they're not cross Jordan. They're in Sinai. Okay. Well, this is what uh Kurt said, he said earth, that would, that would be clay. So now I want to hear the why he chose earth. Well, they didn't have, uh, it's a picture of humanity. It's the earth is the clay, the earth, and they would slaughter an animal upon the, the earth. They didn't, oh, I, I couldn't picture them. I didn't picture them moving a lot of rocks. Around but they didn't have to, they were up under a mountain. I guess they could have gathered them from the base of the mountain. Uh, she's going to be some flip flopping. I too. have the answer. I don't know. She's, she's going right to the book. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> last, uh, in the last week's chapter, in Exodus 20, it says, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, thou shalt sacrifice unto thee burnt offerings and peace offerings. That's exactly what they did. Thy sheep and thy oxen in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is the answer. It is earth, an uh, altar of earth. You know, right answer, wrong, wrong reason. But <laughs> I just remember him. You know, but um, yes, it is an altar of earth. Good guess, you know, just wasn't good enough. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, you get, you know, you, you get a half a point for trying. So, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Read further. But if thou make an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it with hewn stone. If thou lift up thy rod into it, thou shalt not pollute it. Neither shall I blow up the stuffs into mine altar, for thy nakedness shall not be discovered. How do you know? They said you could use either. No, actually it says, you know, to make an altar of earth. But if thou will make an altar of stone, huh? Right. If you make an altar of stone, you know, so that doesn't mean you have the option at, um, at first, but if later down the line you make an altar of stone, you know, which they did once they crossed the Jordan, you know, and and so, you know, and that's for a reason, you know, but yeah, you know, it specifically says for them to make an altar of earth, you know, but they had, they had uh, uh, another type of altar they could also make, which they did at, at another time, you know, so that is, that is the answer. Another point of interest is the Dab and the Bihu, you know, and, and this is really interesting, you know, I, well, I found it really interesting, you know, uh, concerning the Dab and the Bihu, because uh, the Dab and the Bihu were the first two priests, you know, um, up under Aaron, the high priest, right? You know, and they got to see Elohim. And yet they were the first two priests to die. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that's not funny. But <laughs> you know, um, yeah, strange sense of humor, actually. Um, yeah, but they, you know, they were the first two to die. You know, so I found this to be really interesting because the reason that they died. Anyone re remember why they died? They offer strange fire, you know, and what I found really interesting concerning our, our story 
you know, something that jumped out um, at me, you know, uh, you know, actually for the first time. And that was Exodus 24, 17, which says, and the sight of the glory of Yahuwah was like devouring a devouring fire atop the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. You know, so when they looked at the fire, they would have been reminded of Yahuwah. You know, and now you can see the connection with them offering strange fire. You know, they equated Elohim with the fire, but they offered a strange fire. Could they not have been offering to a strange hell? Say, I just point something interesting, just point it at me. All right, and Another point of interest is Exodus 24.10. It says, there was beneath his feet a pavement of sapphire stone like the, he like the very heaven for clean clearness. You know, and so this was a point, point of interest as well because, um, you know, beneath his feet, you know, was this sapphire stone, you know, and, you know, so it seemed to speak that his throne was made of sapphire, you know, which Ezekiel actually confirms, you know, in Ezekiel 126, it says, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man upon it. You know, and so we see that, you know, Yah is being depicted, you know, in a, on, sitting on a sapphire stone. Stone is, you know, blue as the heavens. You know, so could it be that Yah's commandments was written on sapphire stone. Hmm. You know, and with that in mind, could this be why we're commanded that our deceased contain a cord of blue? Uh, now, whether this is the case or not, and I'm not saying it is or isn't, I'm just pointing out some interesting things, you know, but whether that was the case or not, the blue would have certainly reminded them of Yah's throne. And so they were commanded to make these Z6 with a cord of blue. So when they see the blue, they'll be reminded to keep his commandments. See, and when they when they look at the blue, the blue will remind them of his reign, of his throne, of his authority, of his judgment. You know, because these are the things that you associate with the throne. You know, and this is the way that the Eastern mindset works. You know, they, they deal in concretes, you know, rather than abstracts. You know, so they see this, they would, they would have made them think of these things. You know, and so when he was wearing the Z seats, hey, don't wear the Z seats. Not fully dressed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that sucks. Um, well, I still have y'all's name on me, you know, you know, so I'm not completely naked, you know. <laughs> you know. Yeah, so when you look at this, um, the blue of the ZC, you know, to remind you of his throne, of his authority, of his judgment, you know, that he might stay the course, stay on the straight and narrow, 
you know, and not stray. You know, so those are my points of interest. Uh, there were no conflicts. That's all I have for you today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, Pastor. I'm sorry.